Okay, um, thank you Peter for the introduction and especially thank you for inviting me here back to Hong Kong and to lecture this uh, really interesting uh, conference on background. City, actually when I put up this title last night I mean, also had a thing of instead of international architectural symposium, I said, yeah, I found out that was a conference on it was the same thing as Nelson was actually done. He gave a short talk this morning. Um, I call this, um, this lecture, the short lecture, of Development Condition Every Day is, uh, because it touch, will be touching certain aspects of design work uh, we're doing, not in the office, but also at the university. And also the way of um, dealing with the city in order to be able to actually think about urban developments. What is the basics of this? And uh, it's actually by coincidence that the first two sessions we had this morning, the first session of the two lectures was also about um, film, filmmaking, and movies. And we've been doing these movies as kind of situation, as analysis for many years already with the students going to cities with just about no information on the cities and then trying to figure out how does this city actually work and being as subjective as possible. Because it's always the idea of any uh, analyst uh, analyzing a city trying to be objective and I just don't believe in this. It's just about impossible to figure out all the, the whole objectiveness of the city so we try to be as subjective as possible. And then it's after having these films made by the students in situationist analysis. But it's always the problem, the topic of how to switch this into a design work, to get the next step going. And this is something which is very intriguing for me, and so I would like to talk about this part, actually, and so I call it the urban development, and then pairing it with the conditioned um, everydayness. So it's the trying to figure out how a ratio between, say, uh, top-down structures as urbanist planners, uh, urban planners would like to do it, of proclaiming a city and what a city can be, just in thinking in terms of houses, blocks, uh, square meters, and so on. But also then, thinking the other part, let's see from the other side, from the bottom up, the bottom up structure, how does this actually go and, and intertwine with the, um, with the urban fabric we actually to design, or we always have the briefs where we have to work on. And finally, to come up with a, with a highly dense, uh, highly complex fabric um, called the urban. How does this actually work? And can we actually um, design these things? Can we actually develop them uh, say from the drafting board to the computer? Are we able to do so? And which um, complexities do we have to actually getting started. And so I would like to present two case studies I've been working on in the past, sort of working on and um, later also two projects. Two case studies, the one is um, Berlin and the other one is Cape Town. Berlin, of course, was because we had one office there in Cape Town due to my past having a lot of my family in Cape Town and uh, being uh, grown up there. And some years ago, we always thought that these things are so different. Africa or Cape Town is so different than, say, the European context in terms of urban development. And now, all of a sudden, due to very uh, contemporary situations going on um, in uh, Europe, due to migration, due to refugees, suddenly we've got very similar topics we're faced, facing. And suddenly we notice, OK, those in Cape Town are a little bit ahead already they've been working on this problem, this challenge, uh, some time ago already. <clears throat> so let's have a look first at Berlin, a city which has gone through this massive um, development, and then we have to put it into context in this one. Just to point out a few things, uh, we start off in the 1860s with a population of half a million, and then there's this big jump, an incredible jump in, in terms of uh, increase of inhabitants by 2.2 million in a matter of five years, 17 to 22. 
April to give five years, 2.2 million more inhabitants. How can actually a city cope with this and be a city as it is nowadays? And this was this development was due also to certain factors that there was more work in the city and so on. We know all these criteria and parameters. But what is interesting as well that things also developed on other sides as well is how can we be able to build so fast? So this was actually due to building a city, which nowadays looks as if it's a city of bricks and plaster. It's actually steel. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been possible to build all these houses. And at the same time, also developing a very specific typology from having a street-aligned um, buildings, then going back into the um, courtyard, setting up the The uh, a, a courtyard uh, typology, um, so actually densifying the, 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 the different sites. So you've got the street around here, with the big rooms here, and then you've got the court side buildings here, one courtyard, second courtyard, third courtyard, and so on, typical village typology. And at the same time, due to developing this, this typology, also something very specific for Berlin is this so-called Berlin Room or Berlin Zimmer, which is here, which is very specific due to the fact that we see this is the apartment, this is the entrance, and then you would like to go to the back here, and you can't have a corridor here, so you actually have to go through a room. And this room has got very little light, it's just one window in this room. And you see the same typology here as well, so there's this one room here in this corner, which actually <coughs> solves the problem. And you've got the second staircase, you can have this there for, um, for the servants or for a second apartment, you've got the next entrance here and that's on. So just by introducing this room, the Berlin room, this typology was developed, and we've got thousands on them in Berlin. Berlin is just filled, built in these five years. So it was like catalog houses built many of steel, and having this building room. So this is something which is highly intriguing of how to actually cope with the um, big influx of uh, people coming to the city. <coughs> and after uh, 60 years, we have actually an increase of three and a half million inhabitants. So the city has grown vastly right to the, to the end of the war, 45. And then there's a steep drop again. So there's a big mountain over here and it goes down here and then continues on this side over here. So what has happened actually in Berlin? So we can go back to the 40s, we've got this urban fabric of the typical Berlin plan and then going down to 1953 after the war is actually a de-densifying city due to the war of course, people leaving, migrating and so on, splitting the city up in, in east and west, we'll move somewhere down here, going through here, <coughs> East Berlin and West Berlin. And then slowly, uh, slowly recovering again until 89, three and a half million, 3.4 million uh, people. The, the Iron Curtain came down and the reunification of the city of Berlin. 2000, we're going up to 3.38. It's still like keeping the, the balance. But what we notice in comparison to here is actually the city is being densified terms of urban fabric, especially in this part here in the middle, Berlin of Bitter, Berlin Mitte, the central part of Berlin, we experienced a high densification of the city. And then slowly to 2010, increase from another 100,000, going up to 3.4, 3.5 million people. And you notice again in this black map that actually there's, the city is not really growing to the outskirts, it's densifying itself all the time. And Unger has also made, Osman von Matthias has made a study that he claims that Berlin is actually big enough for seven and a half million people and there would be no problem. So there's a lot of space inside the town which can be densified. <coughs> Where is Berlin actually heading for? So the estimates by the city senate of Berlin saying that they're expecting 40,000 inhabitants annually to come into the city. <coughs> about uh, 10,000 apartments. 
But in comparison to former times, this is just about peanuts because we had this number here of 440,000 uh, per annum before. So actually, this is something the city of Berlin should be able to cope with. Maybe there will be a few more, considering the um, refugees, and the challenge of refugees coming to the city right at this very moment. So until 2030, Berlin will be a city of 4 million people. So it's slowly hitting, actually, again, the numbers of the pre-war uh, or the war period um, from 40 to 45. <clears throat> All of this is actually um, not really so exciting, but what is Berlin today? The Berlin, we call actually the cool place, the creative place, the multicultural place, the place of the young. And this is suddenly an image which was actually has been created um, ultimately actually by the former um, mayor of Berlin, Oberweit, uh, who pulled, put up this image of Berlin. And this is not by coincidence, because in the um, post-war time, when we still had East and West until 89, uh, Berlin was a city um, free of German military, for example. And if you wanted to escape military service, you would just go to Berlin and stay there for 10 years, and they wouldn't catch you. So all of, of this generation is now actually the generation now being businessmen and so on, kind of defending their own city. And of course, a lot of young people are coming there to study, and it's very, as it is multicultural, um, people are highly interested in this field as well. And we know that from the 10 million tourists coming into the um, city at the moment, 70% of them actually come because of the off-cultural program in the city. So it's not the high culture of the city, which is of interest, but of the off-culture program. So where is the city now heading for? Is it kind of has this image or it has created this image of its own? It's, kind of, it's not Paris, it's not London, it's not Madrid, it's not Rome, Berlin is Berlin. And this is the interesting part. Can the city now um, actually be open enough to change? Or is it something which say, they would like to preserve this image? And there's a big discussion going on at the moment because they're introducing a city tax, and they're claiming that city taxes, especially by, paid by, by tourists, and 70% of this money will then be dedicated to off-cultural programs. So all of a sudden, the, the part which actually causes interest for tourists to come, because nobody knows what is happening, is <coughs> becoming something very official, so it won't be even off-culture anymore. So it's, even in the culture, field of culture, we've got the process of gentrification. But should actually the city then be preserved? On the other hand, the um, politicians say, yes, we should try to do so. So there are very rigid laws uh, concerning um, rental, uh, uh, renting apartments, of uh, increase of um, uh, payment for, for apartments, renting apartments, so they don't actually want the, the uh, district to change a lot. At the same time, when this happens, they don't image of the districts, of the certain different districts in, in Berlin has, will be frozen, and then it's like a museum again. So it's a tough question now actually for Berlin, where will Berlin be heading for gentrification versus preservation? <coughs> Let's look at the second example, which may be you know, very strange for, uh, for you me to show city of Cape Town experienced massive growth right at the very moment. <coughs> 1690 says 1700 was a very small population of only 650 and then 1820, 1830 up to 20,000 people. And you see there's an urban plan already in layout of Cape Town as a kind of block system, grid system uh, city, uh, although there's a very um, dominating topographic situation in the city itself. Into to 1890s, growing up to 67,000 inhabitants, and then finally 1950 to 600,000, 620,000 people. So all of a sudden, there was a big surge of people migrating into this city. <coughs> 
seeing it in these, this bar here, you see how the city is, has been grown. And right down here, soaring up to here. So we've got an increase of 3 million inhabitants within 60 years, which is a number which is very similar to that of Berlin, but it also depends on where to start. <clears throat> so this is from 1950 to 2010. But it will become even more extreme now. Or at the moment, we can see that the last, sorry, to stay with this, the last 10 years or 14 years, there was an increase of 1 million inhabitants in the city. And this is just about, just about the number. Okay, so we've got Cape Town with 2001, total population of 2.8 or 2.9 um, million, which is an increase of 77 um, percent. And then there's an estimate for 2025, for the next 10 years, that another 1 million people will be coming to the city. The incredible challenge for the city itself, you can imagine. One million people would need <coughs> about 80,000 inhabitants per year coming to the city. Now there's a certain problem in Cape Town with, due to its beautiful topography. The city just cannot expand. It. The Table Mountain near Signal Hill, the Heinz City, the Devil's Peak on this side, so the central business district is in this part here. And so the only possibility for, for the city, so this is what I showed you just now, the only possibility for the city is to expand into this greater municipal area here. <coughs> so actually could claim the city center is the wrong place. It should be somewhere here or somewhere over here, somewhere in the middle, but due to historic reasons and so on, it's just here. And here we go. Here we have got all the problems you can just um, imagine. <clears throat> At the same time, the city cannot expand, say, down to this part because all of this is nature reserve. Going right down to Cape Point. So let's just wonder what is staying here. So there's only this area here, which are the Cape Flats. <clears throat> and in this part here, so with the whole population can actually expand. So whatever we have here in terms of infrastructure, everything has to be actually moved into that part of the city center going in there for the whole city. And this is so it's not only an increase of one million people, but one million people on the wrong side, on the different difficult side. Also, one million people expected now in the next 10 years will be uh, low educated, low income people, so no further tax income for the city. So whatever the city has to do now to actually cope with really additional people, they don't know actually how to afford it because there's no additional tax income coming from these people. <clears throat> In terms of density, which we see here, we have the central business district over here, and these are the Cape Flats over here, so the densities are actually quite high. So it's a it's a low-rise, high-density area, but there are also vast areas with low-rise and low-density going around here as well. And this is the great municipal area. And there's still um, the airport, the international airport of Cape Town. So how to cope with this? How to cope with the situation? It's a typical um, urban development of one of the suburbs we, you have different phases of development. I would say this is the, the informal part, and slowly it will be formalized, which you can see here, or you can see here, with less density. Or here the density is still quite here, and the highest density we have here. So you can imagine when also this or this will happen here, so these people will have to move to other places, or only a few can afford these houses, or. Um, will be have enough space in, in this area, and then there's like small pockets still in these areas. So at the same time, there are very different um, developments of formal and informal settlements in, in these townships in the capital itself. And how to handle with this, how to handle this, especially just picking up one, uh, picking up one part, which is um, public transportation. <coughs> 
when uh, South Africa hosted their World uh, Championship, foot, uh, Soccer Championship 2010, um, a new system of um, buses was introduced, the old My City bus. A fantastic system, especially if you come from Europe and you see all these um, separate lanes in between the highways and some express buses going through the whole city. <clears throat> At the same time, there's also the system of minibuses, uh, which is very common, actually most used, and, and trains as well. <clears throat> and then due to the fact that the city center where everybody is actually then commuting to is in the wrong place, maybe so the wrong place, and the low income uh, parts are down here, we've got this incredible situation that 60% of Cape Town's population spend 40% of the income just for public transportation, which is incredible, really incredible. <coughs> then these, say, 1.5 million people over here at the moment have to be fed into this part here, into the central business district. So you've got a few train routes you've got the public bus or the My City bus, express buses going in here. But the astonishing thing is that these buses are always empty. The empty buses going actually every 10 minutes, 15 minutes on these routes and nobody's using them because there's still this very strong tradition of using um, the mini buses, the local mini buses where you actually bargain for the price and there's a lot of talk in these buses, very dense situation and it takes them far longer actually then to go, if you take a minibus say from down here up to here, it will take about three hours or two and a half hours, and one hour it will be the express bus. But it's something completely different and it's very, very hard for the city to introduce. Now the city is asking itself, can we, how long can we still afford this system running empty buses? Everybody can see it's costing us a lot and they're expanding the system at the same time and don't know how long they can afford, but they know they have to keep it running because there's no other, there's no other possibility of actually solving the problem of this challenge. <clears throat> At the same time, also by restructuring, redeveloping um, townships, say from the informal to the formal, this goes well for a few, uh, say, years, and then you can see the, the um, informal part over here, the formal part over there, and then there's something they call backyard developments. So all of a sudden, they got the whole development going on, continuing again in the backyards. So this is something I think is highly interesting. We've got this kind of top-down thing going on here. And suddenly, the bottom-up structure is moving into this area again. These are owners or tenants having a house in a small garden, and then they can actually rent out. They do the they rent out the space at the back, and you've got the backyard development. And all of a sudden, again, you've got an increase of hundreds and thousands of people in the same area. And again, this has gotten the, the, the public transportation has to actually respond to this. <clears throat> a lot of research has been done on the backyard developments, and there's actually a own, very own and specific society actually work, living just in these backyards from uh, running canteens, shabims, um, restaurants, uh, neighborhood things are happening here and so on uh, in these areas. So it's not something which you would claim to be um, instable or non-resilient. It is actually something which is to be seen actually in a very positive way. But maybe for us being you know educated or trained um, in Europe, it's first in the first stance very um, strange because we do not know really how to handle these things because we don't have a specific tool actually to um, contain these in this kind of um, development. <coughs> this is a very uh, typical situation we have in, in the townships at the moment. And this, first of all, you think this is the informal and this is the formal. No, this is actually the formal. And this is another part of the formal. But this formal is actually mixed with the informal. Because before it's this, this, the first step would be then absolutely informal. The second step is actually to formalize it. And actually, these, you see all these little tiles here, these columns, 
there for electricity. So everybody here has actually got electricity. This is actually set up in the grid by the municipality, and then there's also a grid of hookups for, for um, toilets and uh, water. So there's a kind of basic supply of infrastructure in this area, and then they can put up their own houses that are around here. And of course, they don't have to pay any rent. After this next phase, they should to have these brick houses. Now then there's a next problem coming up that families will not move in, in a, into a multi-story brick house due to religious reasons. They will not accept somebody to live above their head. So these are only working at the moment as kind of bachelor dormitories, which are, of course, in the social context, um, highly critical and cannot really be controlled. So we would, the first thing we would actually claim would be uh, you have to densify, you should be densifying this area of this incredible growth. <clears throat> but at the same time, they said it can only be low rise, high density. The other things will just not work and can will not be accepted. So you've got so certain planning tools, certain uh, analysis you can do it on the one hand, but on the other hand, you've got the tradition, you've got the religion, and so on, working in, in this and trying to intertwine at the same time. <clears throat> so these are actually two um, case studies which I would like to point out to you, where you've got cities of the similar size, but now Berlin is like growing with 40,000 per year, and difference of what will actually be expected or how to handle it. And even the municipality of Cape Town, they will just don't know how things will work out the next 10 years. Because there are no adequate tools of development right at this very moment. But <clears throat> the most important thing is actually to actually observe and perceive on these most different levels. Let me come to two projects which I briefly would like to show or just to sh focus on uh, one or two aspects in these pr um, projects where actually the bottom-up and the top-down process has been um, introduced. <coughs> this is a project for the German, uh, Vietnamese German University in uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, City, Greenfield Development and our idea was actually we invited them uh, trying to combine very specific situations of the European context and of the Vietnamese or segregation context on the other side, saying that actually we, even if this would be a greenfield development, always would like to have the university in the middle of the town, especially the architects who would like to live in the middle of the town. The campus is not the real thing. At the same time, um, how can we actually make it work as a Vietnamese town? <coughs> because this university is meant to have 10,000 students and uh, 2,500 staff members, everybody to live on site. So it's university buildings and dormitories at the same time. Being at a Greenfield development, we said, okay, let's start up with just a very rigid uh, uh, system of organizing it. We we'll say we've got a more or less square, it's always an as if project. It looks as if it would be a square, but it's not a square. It looks as if this would be a diagonal, but it is not a diagonal, and so on. And then we say uh, we've got always bars, which are faculty buildings. We've got faculty buildings along here, and then dormitories on that side. So during the day, you've got the say, people commuting along here, during the evening on this side. So it's not like a business park or a typical campus, which is like deserted at night time. So life would be here day and night. <clears throat> and this also after observing um, the local situation for a long time, very intensely, of how actually public space is being used and reused and what is happening. So we can say that actually in this campus being at just like 400 or 500 by 500 meters, uh, we won't allow, allow any uh, vehicle and traffic into this area. So it can be uh, pedestrian traffic only and motorbikes or motorcycles and scooters. And so the whole public space is of a completely different, um, say, atmosphere and character. So just having no streets anymore, it's just one big square, or one shared, like shared space, this thing can be utilized by the um, students, by the teachers, whoever will be staying here. <clears throat> and it's also the system of um, 
in how far do you actually set the marks? In how far do you actually show the frame that you would provide to create a high potentiality of public space being used in a way you cannot actually predetermine? This is something which we think is very important. That there's always the freedom for things to happen which we cannot predetermine now, or it will predict now at this time. <coughs> square which is not a square because this is a, a ravine or an area which is flooded during monsoon time so there's a lot of water in here, the big faculty buildings, dormitories along here. So it can be this um, kind of very small but lively um, public entity running as a, as a city. Second project we'd like to show is um, something we're working on in unit at the moment. 13 hectares for 1,400 apartments uh, in an area very typical uh, from the 70s um, with these huge buildings, uh, residential buildings. We've got the structure in, say, in the western part and also in the eastern countries at the same time in the socialist or the communist countries had the same structure, urban structures as the west. And at this, on the other hand, this residential part over here and now site is right in between kind of knitting into the fabric of both and trying to be setting up something like a missing link which was um, highly difficult but the moment we see this plan actually working quite well in most of the things that have been done but I would just like to focus on one part in, in this area um, or two parts one is that we've got a big forest here, so we said we'll pull it the forest as a big public park in this area <coughs> and put the houses around. So there was a brief of course asking for 1,400 apartments. So when you decide to make this huge park, of course you will hi have higher buildings on the other side of, of the park, which is clear. So we've got the more kind of urban character situation atmosphere around here, but the public park and we wanted to have this park to be as public as possible. So this is the second part I would like to focus on is this part here, which we call a promenade. And this is something we don't have any example of to show as a kind of best practice, what is it and how can it work. It was quite tricky, especially in the how to propose something which we cannot explain because we cannot present the project. <clears throat> but to say there's just houses for buildings aligning one side and the other side is completely open and everybody coming here, say from this neighborhood, they can go to the park. But we also said from this neighborhood, from that neighborhood, from that neighborhood, everybody can actually now use the park. It's completely open as if this would be a lake or say a bay, but it's just a big park and you've got this promenade here. And it was very hard actually to communicate this idea um, Julian finally understood it, but what's in the process of master planning. Um, in Germany, all these people living here, they have to be invited to actually see the project and discuss this project. And now, we're to, to talk about this, to tell them that there's a benefit for them, and now it's a green field here, that people will have houses here, they still can have suddenly a park or a public space, which in this area they could never use before. This was a very long and, and difficult process in, in terms of communication, of trying to explain something nobody of them had seen before. And we as architects also said, well, we also don't know any best practice. So you cannot go to a city to, to visit these things. <clears throat> so a lot of detailing had to be done in the process of planning to finally say, okay, we can imagine the atmosphere to be like this. Beginning from, say, just having houses lying on one side and the open side on the other side, three lanes of rows of trees. Also, convincing the municipality um, the old traffic in this area will be just uh, limited to 30 kilometers an hour. This means you've got different speeds, you've got different widths, you've got different bus lanes, you've got different bicycle lanes, and so on. Actually, then finally to make this part um, work. And we again don't see it in in terms of the detailing of this area, but just to say we are providing space for something which might happen. If we're lucky, it will be an exciting, a very lively place. If, if not, then we, well, it's, it's a bad thing. 
But at the same time, we say it should be potentiality is very high because it's not only open to the top, but this is also the fact the side facing south. And as we have so little sun, uh, the sun shine is always very important so everybody can just go here into the um, <clears throat> okay, so this, that's it. Just to figure on a few aspects of, you know, this bottom-up, top-down ratio, which I think is very important to find out, and it has to be very site-specific as well. We cannot say in Cape Town the same as Berlin or as Munich. Every site has got a different challenge. Thank you very much.